Hey Dice Gang, CJ here. This time I'm going to talk about how to create your own custom D&D class. 5e, of course. In terms of experience creating D&D classes, I have published a 5e compatible class inspired by JoJo's Bizarre Adventure that's become a platinum seller. And I've also released a pro wrestler inspired barbarian subclass that's gone Electrum. What I've discovered about creating a great class is that before you actually go ahead creating it, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions first. 1. What are you creating it for? 2. Who are you creating it for? Once you answer those questions, the rest of the process is a cakewalk. But before I walk you through these questions, I'd like to tell you something about our sponsor for the video, Campfire. World building is a lot of hard work. Whether you're a dungeon master or a budding writer, you know that you often waste too much time organizing stories and spend too little time doing actual writing. Speaking from experience here, folks. But organizing stories don't have to be hard. Because Campfire Pros got tons of tools that can help you do that. Campfire is a writing software that lets you track character details, arcs, and backstories. It's got timelines that can help you hammer out plot points, you can track their character arc, and even use the map view to create all the locations you need. With the new expansion, World Building Pack, you can even get more tools to help build your story's world. It lets you create new races, species, items, magic systems, and develop your cultures with religions, philosophies, and language with this massive bundle of features. You can get Campfire Pro with one-time purchase of $49.99 and it is $74.98 with the World Building Pack. Trash those extra Word documents and spreadsheets. You can keep everything easily accessible with Campfire Pro. The link to that page is in the description. So click on it to learn more. Okay, now back to the questions. What are you creating the class for? Is it for fun, for sale, or is it just something you want to distribute to other fans? Once you've answered this, it is easier to answer the next one. If you're just making the class for fun, then most likely the main audience is you. But you will still have to convince your dungeon master, of course, to let you play it. Which means that you will still have to address the concerns of the DMs. Do they want balanced characters? And do they restrict the themes? I think it is fair if they don't want to see Inuyasha characters in their Middle-earth setting, and vice versa. If you are making it for your friends, then obviously you should pay attention to their skill level and adjust the mechanic complexity accordingly. But if you are trying to distribute it widely or even sell them, then you should also pay attention to the theme or archetype complexity. Pro wrestlers and samurais are easy to understand. But if you are making something relatively obscure like Homestuck characters or puppet users in Cirque de Karakuri, then you should put more work explaining it and create a narrative to fit it into a generic fantasy world. By my own observation, usually those who are willing to spend some money on D&D products are quite dedicated to the hobby, so you don't have to make the class mechanic too simple. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make it easy to understand. Yeah, of course, the most important thing is to create a fun class but it is still important to anchor it to the obvious limitations. When I say limitations, I mean the complexity and efforts required to play the class. There are three categories of complexity that make up the overall complexity. In terms of roleplay, the character can be as complex as you can make it. But classes like warlocks and paladins have the added requirement of having to deal with a patron and keeping their oath. This actually provides extra work for the players and also the DMs, who may have to roleplay the patrons or keep tabs of the paladin's oath-breaking. This is why I made the phantasms of my channeler class a non-sentient entity, because the mechanic is already quite complex, so I don't want to add an extra layer of work for everyone. In terms of mechanics, spellcasting is difficult for beginners, but once you get the hang of it, it is easy to understand other spellcasting characters. So if you want to target a class for other players who are already playing D&D, then it is easy for them to pick up. The easiest type of class features to understand are the ones that give you passive number bonuses, like the rogue's expertise or the fighting style for many of those martial classes. 
Unique features like the Monks the Flag Missile and the Warlock's Eldritch Invocation take some getting used to, and can range between moderate to difficult. The Channeler's features are actually quite unique and hard to understand for those who haven't watched Jojo Part 3 and beyond, so I had to include a lot of diagrams to compensate for it. That's why theme is really important. If the player knows the source of inspiration for the class, then it is easier to roleplay and understand the class's mechanic. So you should tie the roleplaying and the mechanic aspect with the class with a unifying narrative. Even if your target player know the source, write it as if they don't know the source because your custom class might be slightly different from what they imagined it to be. This part take a bit of writing skill, and you might have to rely on mnemonic techniques to help the reader remember and understand the class's role in the combat and role-playing part of the game. Also, always keep in mind how much work you are making the DM do. Sometimes, they just won't allow the class if it is too much hassle to DM. When making class features, flat bonuses equals boring. And you know what's exciting? Features that you need to actively use. Especially those with high cost and high reward, like the open hand monk's quivering palm. But you kinda have to balance them. If there are too many techniques that require action, the player might get too many options and forget about some of them because they usually just rely on a few of the best ones. If all the costs are too expensive, then the player might get dried out too quickly and become useless midway. Or they might hoard all the resources and not do anything until they realized that the day had ended. The last thing you need to do is some balancing. But you need to know why you are balancing the class. If the reason is just your class shouldn't be stronger than other classes, then it is pointless. The purpose of balancing in games is to give the chance for other players to also shine and not hamstring your class in other pillars of adventures. We've got the good old three pillars of adventuring, right? Combat, exploration, and social. If your class is too focused on one thing, then it might become useless if the rest of the group is doing something else. Most fighter subclasses are very combat focused, but even they can contribute in other situations. So as a general rule, try to keep the classes useful in at least two pillars of adventure. It is awesome if you can create features that will work in and out of combat. In terms of combat balance, just project out the damage output of the class by the level and compare it to the existing classes. I have another video that teaches you how to do damage calculation using the AnyDice web app. It puts into account attack accuracy and the average damage output, so you can figure out how much damage increase you have made only by increasing the accuracy. Also, keep in mind that when you make your class, there will always be haters saying that your class is overpowered when it looks as if your class deals slightly more damage than another class. Don't listen to them. Just look at the numbers and the playtest. The Kronos Avenger Chandler subclass, for example, attacks with an invisible phantasm for 1d8 plus charisma modifier damage. Because it is invisible, it attacks most low challenge rating enemies with advantage. Just because it always attacks with advantage, it doesn't mean that it is overpowered. Because the maximum amount of damage it can do is just 8 plus the modifier. Rogues and fighters maximum damage is higher. Sure, if you account for the accuracy, it deals more damage on average than the two. But the average damage for monks is actually higher than the channeler at level 1. In terms of survivability, it is a bit more complex. But you shouldn't just look at the hit points and AC. Rogues, for example, may have okayish AC and the relatively small 1d8 hit die. But they have damage-reducing features like uncanny dodge and evasion. The Kronos Avenger subclass may not have as much AC as the Iron Myrmidon, but the fact that the subclass can hit most enemies from outside their opportunity attack range increases its survivability. So in summary, when creating a class, you need to watch out for these. The audience, complexity, fun factor, and finally, balance. Balance comes last because it is more important to make sure that there are people who want to play your class and they have fun with it. The Channeler class is having a promotional discount to celebrate it going platinum. It is currently 50% off for the next two weeks after this video is published. But if it hits Mithril, then it's going to be extended. 
Alright, that's it for the video. CJ, over and out.